I thank you, Prof. Qari, for uh, the introduction and the presentation. As uh, Prof. mentioned, um, he highlighted an important issue with the myelodysplastic syndrome and how it is really a heterogenic uh, uh, disorder and uh, difficult to treat disorder and also associated with a poor survival uh, outcome for some of the uh, high-risk uh, patients that uh, almost matching uh, those difficult to treat solid uh, malignancy. So today I will highlight uh, the uh, important aspect in terms of um, uh, classification, risk stratification, and, and we'll talk about how to manage low-risk uh, MDS, especially the anemia part of it. Uh, there has been a recent update in terms of classification uh, according to either WHO or, or, or the ICC. Uh, they have a lot of similarity, but there are some uh, discrepancy between both uh, classification system uh, one of the most important thing is uh, nomenclature. Uh, nomenclature. So they, they, in the WHO they call it uh, myelodysplastic neoplasm, while in the ICC they still uh, call it the uh, myelodysplastic uh, syndrome. The uh, lineages, the uh, multi lineages, uh, uh, or single lineage or multi lineage, was removed from the uh, WHO, and uh, uh, morphologically defined uh, uh, subclass still. Uh, using the excess blast in the um, ICC, but also they include MDS AML uh, criterion for those who has uh, more than 10% uh, blast. Uh, while in the uh, WHO, they name it according to the blast percentage with uh, different like low blast or increased blast one or, or, or two, and they add fibrosis to those with MDS and uh, myelofibrosis. In terms of ge genetic, genetically defined um, um, uh, uh, MDS, uh, both of them they incorporated the SF3B1 and the uh, TB53 with the different criterion for each one of them uh, in, when you go to the, to the details um, and both of them they kept the same uh, 5Q uh, MDS uh, syndrome. Uh, over the past decades there has been um, uh, multiple uh, uh, scoring system that helped to um, classify, to um, uh, risk stratify the uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. Ten years ago, uh, we uh, had the IBSS, or revised uh, IBSS that we, we have uh, been used uh, so far. However, uh, uh, ten years later, uh, uh, we had the new IBSS-M, which is adding the molecular data into the uh, equation. And by using that, the IBSS-M, it's, it's, it's basically an IBSSR with the addition of uh, molecular data for certain set of genes that we'll talk about it. And by, by incorporating that, you will be able actually to upgrade some of the uh, intermediate and low risk MDS into a higher risk uh, MDS. Uh, so basically better uh, definition or defining certain subset of uh, MDS patient that they are really a high risk patient and should be treated in, in a totally different uh, way. Uh, this is an example where you were you able to uh, calculate the IPSSM. It's a very difficult uh, way of calculating this. You will need really a calculator because you're looking into Cox regression, sophisticated Cox reg regression model that uh, by entering some uh, certain uh, variables and some uh, list of genes that uh, will help you to define exactly where your patient will be located in terms of uh, risk stratifications. Th those are uh, most of the genes that are incorporated. There are around 16 or 17 gene mutation that is incorporated. And also there is another subset of uh, residual genes that also can be incorporated into this. Each gene has specific uh, strength uh, that uh, can incorporate it into uh, the model. One um, important thing here is, is the number of gene, number of driver mutation the patient has. So the higher the number of driver mutation, you can see the survival curve will drop significantly based on how many driver mutation the patient has, indicating that this is really a syndrome that is really driven by um, uh, genetic mutation and it has a huge impact on the outcome for those uh, patients. Um, looking into the uh, survival outcome based on the uh, risk stratification, uh, the new IPSS uh, M uh, system has been validated by multiple um, uh, cohorts involving thousands of patients, uh, indicating how strength it is uh, to use this uh, model. And comparing it to the IPSSR, you can see that uh, the survival, the median survival for those with uh, low risk MDS has been prolonged a little bit. Uh, indicating that removing some of the previously, we thought that they are um, uh, uh, low risk or intermediate risk into a higher risk 
uh, uh, patients. So in general, in terms of uh, treatment for MDS, really there has been, hasn't been any uh, huge progress in terms of uh, intervention since the um, is a cytidine or a hypomethylating agent. So n none of the uh, recent interventions can actually improve uh, the overall survival, but there are some disease modifying agent that we will talk uh, about them, especially for the uh, low risk uh, MDS. So what are the low risk MDS? According to, uh, depend on the, what kind of uh, uh, scoring system that you will use but usually involve very low, low, uh, and uh, moderately low uh, MDS if you look into the IPSSM. And the goal of treatment depends on the risk. So for high-risk patients, of course, our goal of treatment will be cure and preventing disease progression into acute myeloid leukemia because we know that they have a higher risk of progression. So the aim is to cure those patients and usually by uh, uh, delivering uh, curative uh, th therapies such as intensive therapy and followed by allogenic stem cell transplant for those patients. Uh, however, for low-risk patients, because their median survival is uh, 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 more than uh, probably 10 years or so, so the, 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 the care or the goal of care in this situation is completely different by is usually focusing on the uh, improving quality of life, uh, reducing the transfusion uh, burden, uh, that will be the uh, ultimate goal for those uh, patients. Anemia is the most uh, common um, um, uh, 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 presentation for those uh, patients, with, especially with low-risk uh, MDS. And uh, actually it is associated with increased uh, mortality based on multiple uh, cohorts. Um, and uh, it is uh, really associated with a huge uh, 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 decrease in the survival, especially for those who are uh, transfusion dependent. So you can see clearly patients who, ha who are heavily uh, transfusion dependent, they have a uh, uh, drop in their uh, overall uh, survival. And this is actually regardless whether they progress uh, into acute myeloid leukemia or, or not. So the, uh, the death uh, in those patients usually are related to their uh, risk of progression into uh, acute myeloid leukemia. Um, the use of uh, chelating agent is, uh, is important for those patients, but really there is no really strong data to uh, suggest or support the use of this uh, agent. Um, however, this is a recent uh, randomized trial for uh, enrolling patients uh, who are transfusion dependent uh, well, with the use of uh, uh, XJ versus uh, placebo. And the primary point was the event-free survival defined by uh, uh, time to, uh, from the date of enrollment into the first documented non-fatal event, and that's including uh, cardiac dysfunction, liver dysfunction, and uh, acute leukemia transformation, in addition to uh, death. And, and this study showed clearly the use of XJ was able to reduce the ferritin level over the years. And uh, after uh, a good median uh, follow-up, there was actually an improvement in EFS for those uh, patients. However, they could not demonstrate an overall survival, uh, especially because of the inability to continue the, the, the study because of the poor accrual into this uh, uh, study. Uh, so, uh, the, 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 the first line of treatment for uh, anemia in, in patients with mild dysplastic syndrome is the use of erythropoietin stimulating agent. There has been multiple studies uh, showing uh, a wide range of uh, efficacy, ranging between 30 to, I would say, to 50% uh, of uh, response rate. But this kind of summarizes uh, the uh, response rate for those patients. So basically, one third of patients, they will respond initially, and those responses uh, usually uh, durable to one year or so. Um, however, there are a good fraction of patients, they are primary refractory to uh, use of erythropoietin uh, agent. More recently, the use of darboboietin has been evaluated in randomized study showing a good response up to, I would say, 50% uh, or so. Uh, there was no risk of uh, secondary malignancies or uh, transformation to AML, uh, where most people they are afraid of when they are thinking about using those uh, agents. So, uh, it's still an effective way to treat patients with uh, low-risk uh, MDS. Um, according to the data from a Sweden registry, uh, showing that those with low transfusion burden is the most important, uh, most 
people that will respond into the use of erythropoietin stimulating agent, and even some of those, uh, um, some of these data showing that there are improvements. Well, it's a retrospective data, but there are improvements in overall survival for those who are treated with erythropoietin agents, uh, especially when it's combined with uh, with the GCS. So we'll talk about a novel agent, uh, the loss battle shift, uh, which is used uh, for uh, uh, the ineffective erythropoiesis. And uh, um, this is a kind of first-in-class erythroid maturation uh, agent, especially it's uh, like a, a recombinant fusion protein that consists of the extracellular domain of the uh, activine uh, receptor uh, type 3B and attached to the uh, human immunoglobulin uh, FC uh, domain. And you can see here that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the fusion protein will attach to the, uh, uh, to the uh, 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 TGF beta uh, ligands, and this will lead to the inhibition of the uh, SMAD uh, signaling. And by inhibiting the SMAD 2 3 uh, signaling, this will lead to enhancement if, uh, if of the uh, uh, erythroid maturation. Um, and this enhancement of erythroid maturation, usual, maturation usually happens in the later, sta later stage because erythropoietin is in, uh, important in the uh, initial, initial stage of erythroid progenitor. However, the uh, loss make uh, m work mainly in the later stages of uh, 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 erythroid uh, maturation. Uh, based on the early phase studies, uh, use of uh, loss specific specifically in a subset of patients with SF3P1 uh, uh, mutation, and with the use of uh, uh, and all the SF3 uh, B1 mutation and those with the ring uh, sideroblast uh, uh, myelodysplastic syndrome, um, uh, a randomized uh, 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 double-blind placebo-controlled study conducted in the low-risk uh, patient, uh, and those include patients with uh, SF3 B1 mutation or uh, ring sideroblast um, um, uh, MDS with, uh, of course, uh, less than 5% blast, uh, no 5Q deletion, uh, with, uh, who are uh, refractory to erythroid uh, stimulating agent, or the, they are erythroid stimulating agent naive, but they have higher level of uh, uh, able more than uh, 200, and they are uh, transfusion uh, dependent. So this is randomizing patient between loss betercept to placebo, and uh, the primary endpoint was uh, um, free uh, transfusion for uh, eight weeks. Uh, this is a patient uh, demographic. You can see that's almost uh, equivalent between uh, both arm. Around uh, more than 40% of patients, they are really heavily transfusion dependent, requiring more than six units per uh, eight weeks. Uh, and uh, almost uh, uh, more than 95% of patients, they are refractory to uh, erythroid stimulating agent. So this is the primary endpoint where it's met. Around 38% uh, of patients, uh, they, were, uh, met, they met the primary endpoint, which is uh, uh, red, uh, tr uh, transfusion, red cell transfusion independence in more than uh, eight weeks, versus 13% only in those on uh, placebo arm. And these uh, responses were uh, somehow durable. And uh, uh, and this slide indicating the other secondary endpoint where uh, erythroid responses uh, that last more than uh, up to 24 uh, weeks uh, reach up to 53% uh, in uh, loss of tested versus 12% in the uh, uh, placebo arm. Uh, at first event, there was no uh, significant uh, uh, signal in terms of uh, adverse event uh, in, uh, between loss of tested and uh, placebo arm. Um, looking into any grade uh, uh, symptoms, uh, fatigue was actually more prominent in the patient receiving loss patercept. Diarrhea as well uh, was also prominent in those uh, patients, but none uh, in the uh, grade three. So, <clears throat> based on this, uh, another trial was designed, uh, building on that, looking into using this into the first uh, line. So the command trial was designed to answer the question whether using loss in uh, um, uh, erythroid uh, stimulating agent naive patient as a first line, comparing this with the standard of care, which is uh, epotene uh, alpha. 
So this is a ruling, uh, basically any patient with myelodysplastic syndrome doesn't have to be uh, ring sideroplast uh, or SF3B1 uh, mutated uh, uh, MDS. And uh, also uh, including a patient with low risk or intermediate risk and uh, they uh, uh, should have an erythropoietin level less than 500 so you can compare with uh, um, erythropoietin uh, stimulating agent uh, and also uh, uh, a patient should be transfusion uh, dependent. So they com compare loss better set versus uh, erythropoietin alpha. Primary endpoints were transfusion independence for more than 12 weeks. Um, patient population were equivalent between both uh, arm. Um, you can see here more than around 60% of patients, they have lower actual transfusion burden, uh, less than four units per eight weeks. Uh, for some reason, uh, majority of patients actually they were ring sideroplasts, around 70%, which is not the usual typical distribution of uh, low risk uh, MDS patient. And the primary endpoint was met actually, uh, where 60% of patients receiving gross patercept, they were able to achieve transfusion independence for more than uh, 12 weeks, versus 38%, 34% uh, uh, in uh, epothene alpha, which is the typical uh, number that we see in those uh, patients. Um, these responses were actually um, um, also equivalent in the different uh, subgroups. Um, as you can see here, looking into uh, ring sideroplast patient, the response was actually higher in the ring sideroplast versus uh, no ring sideroplast. Um, and, but, but also, uh, it was equivalent to the patient who are erythropoietin uh, uh, alpha, uh, receive erythropoietin alpha. Uh, looking into uh, different uh, secondary endpoints, uh, the, um, um, uh, the, the loss of battercept was actually uh, higher when you compare it with erythropoietin. And uh, looking into the duration of uh, responses, median duration of response was actually 126 weeks for a patient receiving loss of battercept versus uh, 89 uh, weeks for patient receiving uh, epotene alpha. So based on these uh, trials, uh, um, uh, loss butter suit was approved as a second line uh, uh, in, uh, by the FDA, EMA, and Saudi FDA, and approved as a first line in, uh, based on the US uh, FDA. Uh, another important uh, intervention that is really interesting, the use of lenalidomide. Uh, so lenalidomide was, uh, 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 I mean, uh, evaluated and uh, it's the standard of care for patient with uh, 5Q uh, myelodysplastic syndrome based on multiple uh, studies that even some of those studies showed that there are some improvements in overall survival, especially for those achieve cytogenetic uh, responses. But, but this trial was actually un uh, as asking the, answering the question, what if we use lenalidomide as a preventive measure so we can prevent uh, patient from getting into the uh, transfusion dependency. So this is a multicenter randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial ruling patient uh, with uh, uh, low-risk uh, MDS with uh, a hemoglobin of uh, less than 12, but they are not transfusion uh, dependent, and those should be uh, 5Q uh, patients, randomized between lenalidomide, smaller dose that, than what we used to do, which is only five milligram uh, per day, and uh, uh, versus uh, placebo. The end point was the transfusion, uh, uh, time to transfusion dependency. So this was uh, uh, the result around uh, 25% of patients in lenalidomide, they, were, they, they went into transfusion dependency versus 65% of patients with uh, placebo. And uh, what's important here, the time to uh, transfusion dependency was not reached after five years of follow-up, while uh, patient with placebo, the, uh, the time to uh, transfusion dependency was reached within, at the median time of 11 uh, months. Of course, in this study, they actually look into the cytogenetic uh, responses, and more than 90% of patients actually achieve cytogenetic uh, remission. We don't have data about the overall survival yet, but we know that from previous data, achieving over, uh, cytogenetic responses might improve uh, overall survival for patients with 5Q. So this is something that might change uh, uh, the, uh, the practice. Uh, they use, what about the use of hypomethylating agent? The use of low-dose hypomethylating agent has been evaluated for patients with low-risk uh, MDS, especially those who failed uh, multi, uh, erythropoietin uh, uh, therapy or with low uh, platelet uh, count. 
So uh, multiple study done in different way, different combination, different uh, duration. For example, the first study using the low dose uh, decitabine in a different uh, schedules, uh, showing some uh, CRs and transfusion independent up to 60%. Um, also the use of decitabine versus azacitinine for three days, showing also uh, the ability to achieve CRs and the ability to, uh, to, 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 be, uh, uh, to have uh, to some transfusion independence, especially with the uh, decitabine. And more recently, the, the use of oral azacitinine that is approved already for maintenance therapy for AML. Uh, uh, in this uh, randomized study, um, around 30% of patients, uh, they were able to be uh, uh, transfusion uh, free uh, versus 11% in the uh, uh, placebo group. Uh, more recently, uh, data comes from the use of MLSTAT, which is a telomerase inhibitor uh, that is clinically developed for the use uh, in, in, to be used in myelofibrosis. This has been tested in the um, almost the same patient population who were enrolled in the, into the middle trial, but without the um, um, without mandating the ring cytoplast or the SF3B1 uh, mutation. So this is a kind of uh, low risk MDS who fail uh, hypomethylating, uh, who fail um, uh, erythropoietin, and the patient randomized between MLSTAT, uh, one IV injection every four weeks versus uh, placebo. Of course, you will continue other supportive uh, measure with it. With the primary endpoint of, uh, is uh, transfusion independent within uh, eight weeks, for, for more than eight weeks. So the primary endpoint was met where 40% of uh, patients receiving MLSTAT, uh, they were able to be uh, transfusion free for more, more than eight weeks. And uh, uh, it looks like those uh, um, uh, transfusion independence are uh, durable. And uh, one of the uh, uh, side effect of um, MLSTAT is the cytopenia. So you have to deal with the cytopenia initially with the patient at the initial stage, then patient, uh, hemoglobin will improve with, uh, with time. So, uh, we, we shouldn't forget, of course, to talk about how to treat thrombocytopenia in those patients. Uh, uh, Tibo agonist uh, has been tested in multiple studies, initially with the use of romeplastim, showing uh, uh, outcome, good outcomes, up to 50% response uh, rate. And more recent randomized uh, study between uh, using l back versus uh, placebo, the uh, responses were more than 50%. Uh, and also there was good uh, 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 me me clinically meaning meaningful responses in terms of reduction of uh, uh, bleeding for those uh, patients. Um, there was no risk, uh, increased risk of um, um, uh, leukemia transformation in those uh, studies, but still it's a considered a major uh, concern uh, with, the, with the fibrosis as well. Of course, patients with hypo hypoplastic MDS, uh, the, the best standard is to push them into allogenic transplant if they are young. However, um, if they are a little bit older, so you can try ATG with the cyclosporin, like immunosuppressive therapy, and if they fail, uh, consideration of allogenic transplant should be there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, novel agent under evaluation and testing in low-risk uh, MDS. Uh, one of the um, interesting things that the use of uh, IDH1 or IDH2 inhibitor uh, during the ASH, uh, there has been some data presented in this field. We know that IDH1 and IDH2 can be found in up to 5 to 10 percent of mild dysplastic syndrome. Uh, and um, uh, the use of those inhibitors in, in this specific patient population, they were able to achieve uh, transfusion independence. With that, uh, I conclude and uh, Looking forward for the questions. Thank you.